For another clinician's view, I'm happy to invite uh, Dr. Raya Leibovich from Shamir Medical Center and Tel Aviv University. So good morning, everyone. It's a true pleasure to be here at home at Tel Aviv University, seeing so many friends in the audience. And I would like to thank the organizers for allowing me to share our thoughts on networks of checkpoint genes at the cancer side of the immunological synapse and to perhaps elucidate on implications for immunotherapy. Um, so really, for more than a century, there has been a huge debate between those believing that cancer can elicit an immune response against it, and those who said that never cancer, which is self, will be able to amount a, a, an anti, a good antineoplastic immune response against it. But now we know that this debate is over because we, knew, we know that, in fact, there is way to um, allow cancers to elicit immune response against them. And I'm showing you two, not one, but two covers of Science Magazine, uh, because this really has been the large, the big uh, revolution that we've been seeing in the last decade or so in uh, cancer um, therapy. To, um, to um, explain this, um, this uh, revolution in, in, in a very sim simplicity, uh, we talk about the um, theory of the three E's. Uh, when cancer, uh, when the, the, the cancerous process just starts, we talk about elimination. We talk about the situation in which the immune system can eliminate the cancer. When the cancer progresses a little more, we discuss, we talk about equilibrium, a situation in which cancer and immune cells, immune and the immune system coexist, and then at, at the final stage, when cancer escapes, that's the 30, escapes uh, the immune surveillance by the immune system, this is when we see the clinically significant disease. And if we go a little, if we dive a little deeper, this is a very famous slide uh, which, which uh, shows what, what cancer has to do in order to elicit an immune response. This is called the cancer immunity cycle. And we know that there must be release of cancer cell antigens. We know that there must be presentation of antigens within the right context of MHC. There, there must be prime inactivation of antigens antigen presenting cells and T cells. There must be trafficking of T cells into the tumor, infiltration of the T cells. There must be an antigen recognition and the right stimulation, the right context of presentation of this antigen, antigen in order to allow the killing of cancer cells. And every phase th along this cancer immunity cy cycle, the cancer has mechanisms to evade um, the immune system. Now we're going to look a little deeper at this recognition of cancer cells by T cells and killing of cancer cells, and we're looking at these two interactions occurring either in the periphery of the lymph nodes or in the tumor microenvironment. And again, if we look here, we see in the periphery the antigen presenting cell um, communicating with the T cell, and we call this communication the immunological synapse. Now, do note there's no synapse, there are no neurotransmitters, there are no vesicles, but this is just to, um, to emphasize this sort of kiss, cell cell interaction that occurs here. In the middle of this um, interaction is, of course, the MHC T cell receptor interaction, but then we know today that this interaction, in order to allow uh, effector function of the T cell, there must be co stimulatory signals. And we know now, and this is really has been the major revolution, is that when the T cell expresses an, a protein called CTLA4, then that, that exerts, a, a, that exerts, that allows a signaling of, of, of tolerance within the T cell and in fact prevents uh, the generation of effector T cells, be them killer T cells or helper T cells. And similarly in the tumor microenvironment, we know that a different interaction occurs, a PD ligand um, PD-1 interaction between the T cell and the tumor microenvironment, and here is the here is this interaction again, a co-inhibitory interaction, uh, signaling to the T cell you you must not proliferate and exert an effector cell, rather go into energy, even apoptosis. And so, really, this these two interactions are the basic of the new therapy in 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 in, in, in cancer, the antineoplastic therapy of immune checkpoint inhibitors. If we use monoclonal antibodies, and these have been developed in the last decade against either CTLA-4 on the T-cell side or <clears throat> PD-1 or PD-1 ligand on, uh, on either the T-cell the side or the cancer side, then we 
prevent this uh, checkpoint, we inhibit this checkpoint, thus allowing the T cell to act against the cancer. And if you look at the clinical indications in which we now, uh, in which we now use immunotherapy, then you can see that really this has been growing exponentially. And this is only uh, described in 2018. There are now, by now, more indications in which we use these therapy. So really, this is the therapy of the future, and it's very, very exciting. I want to show you two um, uh, patients from my clinic. One had an upper tract uh, urothelial cancer, transitional cell carcinoma. You can see here on the um, on this slide, you can see all of this um, infiltration. That's cancer infiltration of the ureters, bilateral infiltration of the ureters. And he received anti-PD-1 antibodies. And this is a CT scan about, about six months after start of treatment. He had a complete uh, response. So here you can see that the cancer, in fact, has disappeared. This is pretty much a normal CT scan. When we look at the coronal section, again, here you can see this, this very ugly infiltration of his muscles behind the kidneys. You see that the muscles are infiltrated by cancer. This is exactly how ugly cancer looks. And this is pretty much, as I said, a normal CT. I would have wanted to say that this patient is doing well, and up until three or four months ago, this is indeed what I used to say, but now I learned that this disease has, in fact, recurred. So we'll, we'll relate to that later. I want to show you another case. This is a patient with kidney cancer, renal cell carcinoma, not the clear cell type, the more uh, frequent type, rather a different one, and he came to clinic after exhausting all lines of, of previous therapy, and in fact, there was really not much that I thought we could do, but we said we might try uh, immunotherapy, anti-PD-1 therapy with nivolumab, and this is a tumor within the kidney prior start of treatment, and this is how the kidney looks six months after, so the tumor has completely disappeared. And again, if we look in the coronal section, then we see, uh, again, this is the tumor, and this is how the kidney looks. Now, we, we always joke, the patient, the family and I, we joke because they always, in the CT, when they read the CT, they say, state post partial nephrectomy, partial resection of the kidney. They're has been no surgery. This is how it looks on therapy. So this really seems almost too good to be true. And in fact, it is not exactly like Professor Berger said, this is not as it may seem because there are many, many challenges with the use of immune checkpoint inhibitors. So first is that not all tumor types respond. So now we talk about hot tumors, tumors in which this approach may be feasible, and cold tumors. And unfortunately, the cold tumors still contain several of the more frequent tumors that we see. That would be uh, hormonal positive, hormone positive breast cancer and sporadic colon cancer and pancreatic cancer and prostate cancer. So some of our big uh, tumors are cold versus the hot tumors, which would be melanoma and lung cancer and kidney cancer and uh, perhaps bladder cancer. Even within responsive cancers, not all patients respond. So, so if we talk about response rates to single agent anti-PD-1 antibodies in, in, in non-melanoma solid cancers, it would be something around 20 to 25 percent, impl implying that 75 to 80 percent do not respond to immune checkpoint inhibitors. Resistance to immune checkpoint inhibitors does occur, does develop, as I've alluded to with my patient who now has to receive chemotherapy. And of course, there's a whole issue of toxicity by means of immune activation because we, we, we cancel one of the main mechanisms of, of, of immune uh, tolerance within the periphery. So this is not a clinical talk, but this is, of course, something we're all very uh, concerned about and learning all the time as we, as we progress with understanding these drugs. And the most maybe troubling one is that currently there are no a good predictive biomarkers of response to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And there has been many attempts to find such biomarkers. And this is just one slide I took, but there, I could add some more. What um, makes a cancer hot versus cold? And sometimes we even use the terminology of inflamed versus non-inflamed. So if you look here on the left, there would be a chemokine, there may be a chemokine of, 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 of Th1 response that may be high in the inflamed cancers versus low in the non-inflamed cancers. We know that cancers that present a high amount of neoantigens, meaning they may not look in as much as self as, as normal tissues have a higher tendency to, uh, to 
to amount in, in antineoplastic immune response against them versus tumors that have a low neoantigen presentation. PD ligand one expression within the tumor is somewhat of a biomarker, but again, not a zero one type of biomarker. So we do see responses to anti PD one therapy in tumors that do not express this biomarker. And we see many patients who express it that do not respond. So this is not a good biomarker per se. We know that there are other immune suppressive, uh, immune suppressive uh, cells within the microenvironment, such as the myeloid derived suppressor cells, and of course the stemness or the, 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 the biological characteristics of the tumor are of course uh, very important. So really this immunological synapse has been or is the, um, the, the, the basis of our research uh, in our lab, and what we've been really uh, focusing on is the cancer side of this synapse. So, so if you look here, we're actually, we're actually focusing on the tumor cell and its micro environment. And here you see a cartoon, a postdoc of mine, Paula de Boz made of, of an immunological synapse. This is a cartoon. There's no one actual synapse that actually looks like this. We could be put here every potential checkpoint pair that has been suggested to be active. So there's no single cancer that expresses them all and that looks like this. And what we set out to do was to look at the expression of all potential checkpoint messenger RNAs at the cancer side of the immunological synapse and to see how they look across all cancers of the tumor cancer genome atlas. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with this project in which um, with genomes of cancer have been uh, sequenced to a great extent. So we looked both at all 28 uh, cancers within the TCGA, but also specifically we chose as a model, we chose the hot melanoma, which was the cold prostate cancer or in the tepid or warm, if you will, bladder cancer. These are, these are cancers that differ in clinic in their responsiveness to immune checkpoint inhibitors. Melanoma leading the way as being very responsive, prostate cancer being very, very unresponsive, and bladder cancer so-so. And so first of all, you can already see at the messenger RNA level, and you can see here there are 22 um, checkpoint messenger RNAs uh, uh, represented in this slide, and you can take different cutoffs. You can take a cutoff of one transcript per million or five, it really doesn't matter. You can already see that there are differences in the expression of checkpoint messenger RNAs between the different cancer types. So this is, I'm showing you CD70, which is a one, one of the co-stimulatory checkpoint uh, uh, genes. And then I'm showing you PD ligand 1, which you can see that is in fact not, not at all expressed at the messenger RNA level in prostate cancer, perhaps suggesting that anti-PD1 will not be a good clinical approach for prostate cancer. Uh, this is another one uh, showing, again, differences, significant differences in the expression of, of, of co-stimulatory checkpoint proteins, and this is a co-inhibitory uh, checkpoint protein being highly expressed in bladder cancer. And if you look, and we looked more carefully, and we ac actually found that checkpoint messenger RNA expression is highly co-expressed. So if we look again at the three cancers and we look at the, at the expression, uh, the expression, the spearmint uh, correlation for expression of all these checkpoint messenger RNAs, you can see the red, the, the blue signifies a high spearmint correlation. You can see that many, many of these checkpoint messenger RNAs are highly co-expressed together in melanoma and perhaps uh, a little less in bladder cancer and perhaps a little even less in prostate, um, in prostate cancer. And in fact, if you look at these networks, you can see see that of all these 22 checkpoint messenger RNAs that we looked, the number of expressed checkpoint messenger RNAs differs between these two types of cancer. We see that the extent of correlation between the checkpoint messenger RNAs differs between the different kinds of, of, of cancers, and the mix between co- uh, inhibitory and co-stimulatory uh, checkpoint messenger RNAs um, is different between the cancers. Now, of course, this is messenger RNA data. This is not protein data, and we all know that you know protein data can look completely different. But still, we found this we found this uh, to be interesting, and you could um, graph this as sort of networks of co-expressed checkpoint messenger RNAs, and you can see that the that the um, extent of the network, the number of nodes, the number of, 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 of links within the net networks differ significantly. This may already suggest that going with an anti-PD-1 approach to all cancers may not be sufficient, as we very well know from clinic. So I want to tell you two 
uh, two stories now, one from melanoma, one from bladder cancer, uh, of work we've been doing. So this is melanoma, and melanoma is the cancer of the melanocytes. We know, uh, we, 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 we have some knowledge about what happens in melanoma and transformation. This is the normal melanocyte here at the dermal epidermal junction, and then it may undergo hyperplasia to be some sort of nevus, but then when it undergoes um, malignant transformation, we see melanoma, which is a very systemic disease, meaning that it very quickly becomes uh, systemic and can disseminate to, um, to distant organs. And we know we know not, not, not little about the signaling processes leading to malignant transformation of melanoma. And for, for decades it's been known that melanoma was in fact immunogenic, meaning melanoma can elicit an immune response against, uh, uh, can elicit, can allow the immune response to work against it. We've known it for decades, but really the revolution started in 2010 when we saw that anti-CTLA-4, okay, remember this is the checkpoint they expressed on the T cell and works in the interaction between the T cell and the antigen presenting cells in the periphery. In fact, anti-CTLA-4 antibody called epilimumab in fact increases survival in uh, malignant melanoma. And this is here, this is a New England Journal of Paper for 2000, uh, 2010. These are our graphs, the Kaplan-Meier graphs, and you see that still most of the patients do uh, succumb to their disease, but we do see an improvement. And this is for us oncologists, unfortunately, this is a statistically significant and clinically significant result. But then another five years elapsed, and now anti-PD-1 single agent uh, treatments have, um, have um, outperformed epilimumab as single agent therapies for melanoma, and the graphs look a little be better. The last phase was, uh, to, was to combine anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4, and we see now in this New England Journal of Paper, and see these papers are published in the best of journals, so really this is a revolution. We do see that the combination, that's the yellow, oh sorry, that's the yellow, um, the yellow um, line here on, on, on the upper graph is in fact superior to either epilimumab alone or anti-PD-1 alone. So we focused in melanoma on one of potential checkpoint um, messenger RNA ch checkpoint genes called OX40 ligand, OX40 ligand on the side of the cancer and OX40 on the side of the on the of the site of the T cell. And first we were able to show from single cell analysis that um, that OX40 ligand is in fact expressed on melanoma cells. This has not been known before. It was known to be expressed on T cells and on antigen presenting cells, but you can see here from, from single cell analysis that it is expressed on, on melanoma cells, on the malignant melanoma cells. You can also see here from TCGA data that it's not the expression of TNFSF4 is not uh, so much dependent on the extent of uh, T cell infiltrate within the tumor. We have a lymphocyte score which is either low or high for the tumor, but still we see that TNFSF4 is expressed both in, a, uh, both in the primary lesion and in the, malignant mal in, the, in the metastatic lesion. And then we performed bioinformatic analysis on the TCGA of the melanoma, and we did Kaplan-Meier survival curves for uh, for uh, uh, patients who express higher than median and lower than median TNFSF4. And you can see here that high TNFSF4 is associated with, um, high TNFSF4 is associated with better prognosis, both for all patients across the cohort and for stage three and four uh, melanoma patients, being, meaning um, patients who have melanoma dispersed in their lymph nodes or in distant uh, metastasis. Now, you know, some of you know that ulceration is a bad prognostic sign for melanoma, and in, indeed this is recapitulated in the T TCGA data, and indeed the red, the ulcerated tumors perform worse uh, patients with, uh, have worse outcome than, than, than patients than patients have no non-ulcerated tumors. But then if you combine these two mar biomarkers, so we have patients with higher low TNFSF4 and higher low ulceration, then we see that those with an ulcerated tumor, so those with ulcerated tumors and low TNFSF4 have very bad prognosis. Look at how, unfortunately, quickly these patients succumb to their disease. And we can also see that for stage three melanoma, these are patients who do not have distant metastatic disease, rather disease that has had gone to the lymph node, underwent resection. Now there potentially no evidence of disease, but look how quickly and rapidly this, this disease recurs if the melanoma has been 
ulcerated and with a low TNFSA4. TNFSA4 is not part of this network, is not part of this co-expressed network. It's a different, it, it's under a different regulation, so to speak. And the last um, result I want to show you is that when you look, and this is real patient data, when you look at patients undergoing, um, starting on anti-PD-1 therapy, be it pembrolizumab or nivolumab in the clinic, and if we look at their tumor tissue and we look at TNFSA4 high or low, we see that those with a higher um, level of TNFSA4 perform much better on treatment. The response rate is much higher, so 76%, this is a small cohort, but still 76% response rate versus 11, and their prognosis both in terms of disease-free survival and overall survival is better. So really to summarize, TNFSA4 is expressed in melanoma cell lines and melanoma samples, including those with low lymphocytic infiltrates, as is not associated with the ulceration status of the primary tumor. Low expression of TNFSA4 messenger RNA is associated with worse prognosis in melanoma patients and in, and in the cohort of stage 3 and 4 patients. Low expression of TNFSA4 is also associated with worse prognosis in the cohort of low lymphocytic inf infiltrates, suggesting that it is in fact a tumoral or microenvironmental thing, not something coming in from the infiltrate of T cells. It's not, it's not correlated with the expression of other checkpoints, um, checkpoint messenger RNAs, and metastatic patients with TNFSA4 messenger RNA expression within the lowest quartile have significantly worse outcome on anti-PD-1 treatment and a significantly lower response rate to these ag agents. And our hypothesis, which which we're work currently working on is that the expression of TNFSA4 in melanoma cells is imperative in amounting a productive antineoplastic immunological response, both spontaneously, thus preventing tumor recurrence, or in response to immune checkpoint inhibitors, thus eliciting tumor regression. And I won't tell you our second story about bladder cancer of lack of time. I only go, uh, I, I will only go to, to our, our conclusion, and we think that co-expression of checkpoint genes at the immunological synapse is highly regulated by both transcriptional and post-transcriptional mechanisms. And we think that understanding these regulations may allow turning up the heat, meaning uh, changing cold tumors into hot, or at least tepid, in a more efficient way than attacking a single immune checkpoint at the time. And these are my collaborators brought at the Sheba Medical Center, at the MD Anderson, at the, and at the Ellis Center for Immune Oncology. I, was, I already started working in the Shamir Medical Center as well. And I'm finishing with a very, um, uh, very nice quote by John Steinbeck, Steinbeck that discusses about uh, progress, and he says that for, ma for man, unlike any other thing, organic or inorganic in the universe, grows beyond his work, walks up the stairs of his concepts, emerges as ahead of his accomplishments. And I would like to end with this, and thank you for uh, your attention. <laughs>